Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest on the podcast is Shane Edwards, and if you're not familiar with Shane, Shane is a engineer originally based from Sydney, Australia, now living in Thailand. He has worked with people like Hans Zimmer, Trophy Eyes, Hellions, Libertines, North Lane, and a whole bunch more. And in this conversation, we talk about a variety of topics, everything from jumping into the world of engineering full time for artists and what it's like to take that leap and to break off the golden handcuffs of having a day job. So we get into that. We also get into working on orchestral music and his experience in working with Hans Zimmer. And we also get into his hybrid approach, especially when it comes to vocals. He's got this hybrid vocal chain that he really likes. And in this interview, he breaks down the different components of that and why he chooses the different pieces that he does. And whether you're doing this hybrid or you're working all in the box, you can certainly take this idea and integrate it to your own vocal chain. It's actually something that's very similar to what I've been doing for the longest time with my vocals, but he's got a couple extra little bells and whistles in there. So uh, definitely something I'm going to be trying out for myself. And I think you're going to find that part of the conversation really fascinating. So with that said, let's just jump right into it. Shane Edwards, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. How's it going, man? Good, man. Thank you for having me here. Of course. For people who might not be familiar with you or your background or all the cool stuff that you're working on these days, can you give us a little bit of that story and how you ultimately got into music and production and everything you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. So it all started um, in the mid 90s when I was playing in a band and um, it all stemmed from just trying to want to record myself and, you know, make demos for for my band. I always had an interest in recording. Um, It was never... At back then, I wasn't interested in um, doing that full time. I just just like to do it. Um, anyway, long story short, I ended up um, recording friends' bands and um, like got a little Pro Tools rig. I think back in the early early two thousands, it was a double O one, I believe. Um, would record friends' bands and they would like it. They would tell other people and yeah. Then my friend, other friend came up to me and said, hey, look, I've got this rehearsal studio. Why don't you set up in there? And I'm like, no, nah, I just, just want to make demos for my band. And then um, I just clicked one day and said, yeah, just do it. Take a, take a, um, take a big jump and let's uh, quit the day job. And yeah, never looked back. So you just went all in. Like you just like cut your day job off and went all in on this full time then right there, right? Yeah, yeah. It was really funny. So um, in the early 2000s, it was a cool thing to run around and put up posters for your band, like to promote your shows and stuff like that. So my manager at the time suggested, hey, you guys should all go get office jobs so you can use um, their printers and all of their stationary <laughs> stuff to make all this all this kind of stuff. So I was like, yeah, cool. So I worked at a bank, um, not at like the teller, just in the office part. And um yeah, I absolutely used as much paper and uh, stuff that they had. <laughs> and they, yeah, I just decided, you know what, this this ain't for me. So let's, um, yeah, so I jumped in, um, set up the little studio and just started recording, you know, recording people's rehearsals. And it just grew and grew and grew from that point. I love it. That That must have been like a pretty scary thing, because I know like a lot of people, one of their first thoughts about like, you know, a lot of people are really into the idea of engineering. And I think most people start in the same situation as you did, where it's like, you know, you're doing it for yourself, doing it as, you know, to record your own music. And then you're like, I really enjoy this part of it. Maybe I can help other people. But then there's this scary thought that comes in where it's like, well, how do I get paid for this? Like, you know, how do I find mm. people that are actually going to trust me with their recordings? So what was that process like for you? Like, did you feel like, as far as like finding some of your first clients, like I think you said you had a rehearsal uh, place that you can go to. So that must've been like a, a good way to at least get your foot in the door and see a lot of bands. Right. Yeah. I think that was, um, that was a blessing in disguise to get started because I would just do a little, um, you know, record your band, record your rehearsal for like 30 bucks and, you know, <laughs> and just live mix it on the, on the fly. So bands could take it home and yeah, it, it turned out pretty good. And, uh, 
then the bands would say, hey, can we like record a full song with you? And it's like, absolutely. Yeah, what's your rate? It's like 20 bucks an hour. <laughs> yeah, cool. Let's go. So uh, that's how it all began. I love it. No, and that's great. I think that, that that approach to it where it's like, you know, just recording them live might be like the best first way to get in, right? Because it's it's like you can you can still mess around with it on your side, mix it, make it sound good. And then, you know, it, it should, doesn't take a ton of time to, to record that band if it's just like a live situation. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you get to impress them. So I, I think that that's a really cool approach to uh, just getting your foot in the door. It's, it's kind of like that... Um, you know, like that the drug dealer approach where it's like, you know, give them a little taste of what you can do and then, you know, get them coming back for more, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. So was that, so that was like your main um, source of incoming traffic with the, with your studio was just like having that rehearsal place and, and just doing all those live recordings. And then I'm assuming from there, it's like you built your portfolio up and then kind of things got, uh, snowballed from there. Yeah, that's how it happened. So um yeah, to start with little jobs and then it became more and more and more. And it was just me um, in this little room, two and a half meters by three and a half meters. Um, it was tiny. Uh, <laughs> and there was not much gear at all, just enough to make it happen. And, um, you know, every job I would just buy a new piece of gear. Like I think I started with eight channels and, you know, worked up by some like crappy microphones and then more converters and just slowly built it up so I could actually do something useful. Um, anyway, as time went on, I couldn't handle the quantity anymore. So I hunted down my um, longtime friend from school, my, my best mate. His name's Dave Petrovic. And we, I said to him, hey, come on, it's time. Because when we were at, like, uh, at school, we would say, one day we're going to have a studio together. So I hunted him down and I said, dude, the time's come. Let's go. So we'll, let's go into this uh, 50-50. I need, need help. And yeah, got him on board and we would just, yeah, share the room. And it was awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Easy. Yeah. 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 It's funny you mentioned like, you know, those, those early days when you're just like, you're getting started, you don't own any of the gear. So it's almost like you're not making any money at the beginning. You're just like literally trading your time for, for gear, basically. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that, that's why I was so interested <laughs> when you said you, you, you like cut off your job altogether. Cause you know, most people try to do like the part-time thing and run the studio in the background. And, you know, eventually the, the scales kind of tip a little bit the other direction. Right. But, um, yeah, to go all in and be like, I don't have the gear and I need to buy it. And you know, it's a risky, uh, risky time, I guess, as far as like running a business, you know? Yeah, it was. Would I do it now? Absolutely not. But um, <laughs> I was in my early 20s and I thought, you know what? Nothing to lose. Let's do it. Everything to gain. Love it. Yeah, that's great. No, but you, you got to take those chances sometimes, right? I think that that's, uh, that's the big lesson to take from it is that like, you know, just because you're scared about it or you're not sure about like how you're going to, you know, bring people through the door or whatever, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. Like, you just have to put yourself in that, in those shoes sometimes and just actually go for it. And you know, when you're, when you're in that position where you're like, you're like, all right, cool. Like my livelihood relies on this now. Like you figure out ways to make it happen. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, right in the, right in the very, very beginning, there was a, a crossover point as I was setting up. Cause I, I, I didn't just jump in super cold, but I think I'd only lasted about a month. And then I said, no, I, I cut the job off. Um, cause it happened actually pretty quick for me. Um, I was, fortunate just because the studio was popular and had lots of bands and yeah worked out well yeah and do you think that that was like largely because of where you were at that time that there was like a lot of bands in that area or like what, what role does location play in your mind when it comes to like being successful in this industry yeah being around it is crucial i i think yeah yeah if you're too far away it's it's hard but when you're like um when you're at the place where everybody goes to, then, you know, the old saying, you hang out with the barber, you'll end up with a haircut. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, th that's interesting because because that was one of the questions I had for you, which was that, like, I know these days you're working in Thailand and you're working out of Karma Studios, which is an amazing place. Like, just uh, when I was looking into it, it's like such a, a crazy looking destination place. Like, it, it's almost like a luxury resort that has a studio in it from the looks of it. Um, yeah. But I'm curious to know, like, you know, what made you ultimately decide on going to a place like Thailand as opposed to, you know, maybe one of the bigger music hubs, right? Because, you know, to, to that point that you brought up earlier of like being around all the artists and that kind of thing, um, 
you know, Thailand is in a place that, at least, at least to my knowledge, it isn't like a big, as big of a music place as some of the LAs and New Yorks and that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, what made you decide on going to Thailand? Yeah, well, um, well, now I'm I'm not at Karma anymore. Okay. I'm in Bangkok at a place called Studio Twenty Eight, um, which is a, an amazing uh, premises. We do a lot of uh, orchestral stuff as well. There's a huge, uh, huge room here. Um, but yeah, anyway, how I became to how I ended up moving to Thailand. So I was working back in the day with a um, like a metal band. They were, they were called Hellions from um, Sydney, Australia. And we decided, you know what, let's, let's try something different. Let's do our record. You know, Thailand's awesome. Let's go over there and do our record there. Um, so, uh, we found this, uh, our friends, Heroes for Hire, another band, they, were, they had this deal with Atticus and they went to Thailand to Karma Studios um, and they said to me, hey, do you want to come along and be the engineer? And I'm like, absolutely, yes. So um, I went along, helped out with that. We had a great time, got to know the owners over there. And then when we came back, I was working with a band named Hellions and I said, hey, let's go over and do, um, do our record over here. Uh, we made it happen. We spent a month over here and it was was awesome and when we got back it was about six months after that i had a message from like i saw on the um the studio manager on facebook was online and i just sent a little emoji a smile and then she said i need to speak with you i'm like yes she's like okay come over we we need you i'm like whoa okay (laughs) just like now she's like now i'm like i've got six months of work already booked in i can go after that so that that's how that all happened (laughs) and they said you want to move over here and uh yeah set up shop and yeah work out of thailand i'm like absolutely let's do it amazing and how has that thailand scene been for you like do you find that there's a lot of music going around there the scene in thailand is massive actually um my work is like 50 percent thai 50 percent uh global so a lot of um, international people will come here because they can they can walk around and not get recognized. Mm. You know, so we had we had like uh, the Libertines come here. I spent seven months with them um, while they were writing the record, and you know they could walk around. They couldn't do that in Europe. You know, they couldn't walk around um, London or Paris. <laughs> you know, they'd just yeah. get mobbed. So yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a listers would come here just because. That you can walk around, you know, without yeah. being recognized. That's a really good point. And definitely, like, uh, you know, kind of makes sense. We were talking about earlier, like, kind of having, like, it, studios be a destination place, like like Karma. Um, so, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, bigger artists would maybe want that, that break away from their normal place of, of living and fame and whatnot, right? Um yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And and so the studio that you're at now, you had mentioned uh, you have a big floor, you have the, like they do orchestral stuff. And that was one of the things that, that drew me to you is that you do have a really eclectic like discography. You've, you've done everything from like rock, metal, pop, orchestral, or acoustic, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, a lot of people tend to want to niche down in this industry and like become known for one thing only, but you mm. have this very eclectic skill set, I guess, you know? So um, why is it that you chose to have that diverse clientele um, or what, what attracted you to, to doing it that way as opposed to just niching down and being known for one thing only? Yeah. Um, good question. I'm not too sure. I don't know how to answer <laughs> that, but um, back when I started, it was all the one genre, basically it was just like bands. And then you would do one project which crosses over into another thing. And then somebody from that other genre will like get you in and then you, you start doing all different genres. Um, yeah, it's really hard. I don't know how it all, it's all panned out. It's been a bit of a whirlwind, but, um, yeah, I, one day I'm doing like really easy listening type hop. And the next day I'm doing a a hard hitting metal record or, um, house music. I've got, uh, projects coming over from South Africa, as well, like some really cool, like drummy stuff. <laughs> oh my God, there's, there's music from all around the world. And um, I tend to cross pollinate like mixing techniques into each other and it, it creates something a, a little different. 
Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point because I think uh, sometimes that's an advantage, right, of being able to kind of cross pollinate those still those different skills and integrate things in one genre versus another and that kind of thing. It uh, you know maybe maybe it gives you an op- an edge as opposed to the people who just stick to the very cookie cutter way of you know a specific genre, right? Mm. Yeah, sometimes it does work against me. Like I'll, I might um, have done a track. I might be working on a track that is quite mellow. But I just make it a bit hard hitting, like dun, dun, dun. it's like, whoa, chill it out, hey. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's all good though. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, speaking of that that diverse clientele, um, one person that you had the chance to work with that I that I was really impressed by was you got the opportunity to work with Hans Zimmer, and uh, you know, for for the audience that doesn't know, he's a massive, massive film film composer. So uh, you know, has pretty much done all of the big movies out there, you know? Um, so mm. can you tell us what it was like to get to work with him and what the scope of that work was like? Yeah. So, um, the, the owner of Karma, um, Chris Craker, he was on the team for Interstellar for that movie. Um, so that, that was how, you know, we got into the door. Well, me personally got into the door to be in that world. Um, after Interstellar came out, then um, he was commissioned with uh, the Hans Zimmer, the classics, to produce that um, that record there. So you know, he asked me if I would like to get on board and you know, mixing, editing, all of that stuff. So uh, that's that's yeah, that's how that came about. Yeah, and it was um, it was real. That was really, really, really challenging um, because it was a lot different to anything I'd done before. So I. I spent forever just um, tweaking, trying different things, and you know, you only sort of get one shot with stuff like that. Of course, but yeah, it turned out well. Had you ever done any sort of orchestral stuff before that? Not full orchestral stuff back then. It was more like um, orchestral pieces. You know, you might have a a contemporary song that's got a quartet or um, something like that, but never, you know, a dedicated full orchestra. Yeah, of course. Like engineering orchestral music has to be, it, it is very different than recording, you know, say your, your normal rock or pop artist. So as far as like diving into that world and, you know, learning that on the fly, especially at such a high level, you know, what was that experience like as far as like that learning curve? Um, yeah, it's it's different. So what I found was that the the orchestra tend to mix themselves because it's within the playing. You know, you're, you're not going to be slamming violins through 1176s. It's not, doesn't, doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So it's, it's all within the performance and you sweeten it and add, um, yeah, just kind of what it needs. It's the less, less is more. It's all, it's all in the miking and capturing, you know, capturing it. They, you know, mix the song as they're playing you know, with the dynamics, you, you, you want to have a massive dynamic range. It goes from zero to hero, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that makes sense. And I guess if you're working at, especially at that caliber of musician, you're, you know, you're getting these people that are pros, like they know how to control their dynamics. They know how to like, just do a lot of that work for you. So as long as it's like, you know, the proper arrangement, the proper musicians, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, it makes sense that a lot of it would kind of take care of itself. Um, but yeah, as, as far as like miking and that kind of stuff, like, you know, I feel like that's so, so different than just putting a mic in front of a guitar cabinet or something like that. Right. Like obviously it's uh, the orchestral world typically has their own kind of set for, you know, how they like to, to mic things up. Um, so as far as like learning that side of things, like, I'm assuming you probably got some help throughout that process to to learn where things go, or or were you just like researching the shit out of it before you got into it? Oh yeah, well I didn't actually track it. It was tracked in Prague, um, I believe. Yeah, but yeah, but um, here I get on board with some orchestral stuff, and you know, orchestral seems to there's a, there's a lot of common things. You have a tree, you have like outriggers, spot mics, and it's all set up and panned a particular way which I learned that the hard way. I would like pan things like a rock musician and it's like, no, no, no. The first violins have to go to the left and, you know, stuff like this. I'm <laughs> like, but I want it on the right. And it's like, no, it's classical music. You have to do it that way. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like it's like that uh, um, audience perspective kind of thing, right? Like where it's like, yeah. you, you know, you're watching them as if they were performing. So that, that does make sense. Although I can also see where you're at where it's like sometimes – 
it might make sense to also like sonically just move something around to maybe get a little bit more clarity, that kind of thing. But mm. um, but yeah, I guess I, I guess the people that are traditionalists with this stuff would uh, you know want it to be exactly as they're used to seeing it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right on. <laughs> well, um, speaking of like uh, you know your diversity again, like I was I was reading some interviews that you were doing with. Uh, there was one in, in particular that I read with Guitar World where um, they were talking to you about working with a lot of rock artists. And um, one of the quotes that stuck stuck out to me was that they said that a lot of the artists refer to you as like the kind of person who really likes to push ideas to the extreme to make sure that you're getting like the most out of the performances and out of the songs and that kind of stuff. And I'm curious if you can elaborate on that a little bit in terms of like how you like to approach working with artists and, you know, what that initial production lens looks like for you in order to get like those, you know, best arrangements, best performances, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Well, it all starts with a meeting beforehand and, you know, I never force anything upon anybody. And at the end of the day, it's always, always about the song and the artist's vision. And it's my job to get that to a whole new level um, and make their vision a reality. So how we would start, uh, we'd start with a meeting and they'd be say, yeah, let's um, want you to get on board and, you know, do as much as you can, change anything and um, just really do the best. So whenever that happens, yeah, um, we definitely get on board and try some, try some different stuff, like pull the song apart and um, yeah, just details. There's, there's a lot of details. Yeah. Do you find that like, I know, I know there's some engineers who are maybe a little like, intimidated to make suggestions about oh why don't we try this or try that because it's like you know at the end of the day they're like oh it's the artist's song like you know it's they already have this vision they've already probably worked it out like when it comes to suggesting ideas and that kind of thing do you ever feel um like maybe you, you should not suggest things or like or like how, how did that come about for you to at least have the confidence to be able to you know suggest a band like let's try this idea let's try that as opposed to just like you've got your song you probably it's probably perfect you know let's i'll just record it that kind of thing yeah, sometimes I'll just won't say anything. I'll just do something because I, I, I work pretty quickly. But I'll just do something and, you know, let's say it might be some crazy reverse delay thing and, you know, throw that up and I just look over and see. They're like, oh, that's cool. You know, so sometimes you don't have to say stuff. You can just do it. Because I'll say, hey, what's that? Oh, nothing. Sorry, I was just playing with something and you can pull it down. <laughs> if, you know, so you can, you can go that way or you can just straight up say, Hey, I've got this idea. Um, you've just got, it's all about how, um, how you into like what the energy is like in the room. Like if you're all getting along and, um, you know, the ice has been broken, then you can just openly, uh, freely talk about the stuff. But if, you know, if it's a, a tense room or, you know, you don't want to speak up, sometimes I, I won't speak up. I'll just, uh, you know whatever they want to do. But um, yeah, I'll, I'm not really shy when it comes to, you know, speaking up or making a suggestion. And, you know, if, if they're not into it, it's like, cool, we tried, move along. That's it. Leave it in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that makes sense that, that you at least have those conversations earlier on with the artists, you know, about like kind of setting expectations going into a project. And, you know, do you, I feel like at that point there, are you kind of discussing like, your role in the project? Like, you know, do you guys want me to be more hands-on? Do you want me to just kind of engineer it? Like, are those kind of, exactly. those kind of conversations happening? Yeah. 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 Exactly like that. It's like, how, how deep is the rabbit hole? Uh, you know, we want the bottom. All right. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're going all the way down that rabbit hole. <laughs> right on. I love that. Um, cool. Well, I'd love to like switch gears a little bit and talk about some of your um, mixing work as well. Um, I'm curious to know, like when you, when it comes to starting a project, how do you, what's your mindset going into a mix? Like, how do you, uh, approach a new project from a mixing perspective? Yeah. Um, great question. Um, I believe that we're always learning until the day we die. So, um, my, my techniques and everything I do is always evolving as technology evolves, as, you know, music evolves, everything like that. But generally what I'll do, I always request a demo mix of the song so I can hear, um, and also for songs that aren't in English, which is a lot that I mix as well, I'll just ask them just to write a paragraph or two about what the song's about, you know. 
Um, cause everything, when you don't understand the language can just feel like an instrumental. <laughs> Fair. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so people do that and I get a, I get a gist of the song. They might have some references. Um, but when I start a mix, I'm always, the first thing I reach for is the vocal. I work on the vocals first, um, with every single mix. I will get the vocal chain, I'll, you know, clean up like mouth clicks and stuff like that. But I have a, a pretty, pretty compli- not complicated, but I have like a half hardware, half software vocal chain. It's pretty hybrid. Um, so I'll start with that and just have basically mix an acapella first before I turn on like um, any of the instruments. And then after that, I'll move on to drums, you know, because the two most important things I think are um, People want to be able to sing. People want to be able to dance. So that's that's my mindset going into it. And so start with vocals, move on to drums. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. As far as your um, hybrid vocal chain that you have there, um, what kind of what what does that chain look like? Yep. So um, over to the side, I've got a, a rack of compressors and uh, just all hard, hardware goodies. Because I'm a gear nerd, I love gear. Um, I'll send the vocal out. Um, I usually, I like to hit an LA3A first, then into a old Rev H 1176, and then a retro double wide. There's sort of three components that tend to always stay on the vocal chain a lot. But what I'll do is I'll split it out so that I'm printing one dry, one wet, and I'll bring two tracks back into Pro Tools. So it's um I, w- I do a lot of parallel processing. Gotcha. Yeah, never never usually on track. So are you um so those the, those three compressors they aren't in in uh, series together. They're, you're just like recording each in, on the, oh they are okay. Yeah, they're in series. But um, when it first gets split out, I might go into an EQ or uh, something like that, which will then you know go to both channels. Um, that one will get compressed, one will stay dry. But um, I'll just monitor that and then I'll work on the vocals, you know, because I want to, I don't DS with plugins. I like to manually attenuate S's and I also like to um, EQ S's and sibilants as well. But if you're going to like, I found the best way to do that is to have like all of your compression settings in a nice spot. And then you're like, you're mixing the sibilants into that compressor. Then you print it in and that's the vocals done for me. Yeah. So when you have three compressors in a row like that, I'm sure that in your mind, each of those compressors is doing is adding its own little piece to the puzzle. Right. So breaking down those three different compressors, like what is it about each of those that you're that you're specifically looking to get out of them? Yep. Um, I always run a late attack. Everything is slow. I don't want the sibilance to be compressed. Um, I know a lot of people use 1176 into LA2A. Um, but I, I found it works better for me uh, reversing that. So I've got a slow attack first, you know, just it's very gentle. Um, I have 1176 I like to use for energy, um, which I'll run at 12 to 1, but I'll push the the 4 button and the 8 button in. So it's half buttons in, not all buttons in, to get a faster release. Um, again, that's on the slower setting. Um, and then the last thing is the retro double wide, which is on slow attack, fast release, because it's a pretty slow um, compressor anyway, and it just it just glues when you when you've got the the gain structure right on that, you'll notice that throughout the vocal performance, you know, you'll see the eleven seventy six will be working, but the LA three A ain't doing anything. But then in another thing, they all st- they all compress in unison, so they're all doing different stages of how the voice uh, comes out as the voice is, you know, getting louder and softer. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like, um, yeah, like the LA3 is just kind of taking care of some of those big peaks, and then the 1176 is maybe doing a little bit more of the, like the overall smoothening, and then the retro is just kind of like glue, I it's guess. The, it's or, the big bucket of glue on top. With, yeah. <laughs> it's such a lovely, lovely thing. You can compress so hard, and it's it's still so so musical, but... Yeah, I try. I try not to squash it um, too too much. But then again, if the song needs it, I will squash it too too much. <laughs> yeah, it's all about what the what the song requires. Yeah. Of course. And then I'm assuming that uh, after it's gone through all of those compressors, um, I mean, you said that sometimes you'll have EQ before those compressors. Um, but then beyond that, like, 
Uh, you said you'll be doing the manual DSing and that kind of thing. Um, I'm assuming the last piece of the puzzle for you with vocals is just like automation at that point, just to smooth that out, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the the cool thing about... Um, so I'll print two tracks back into Pro Tools, the the dry track and the wet track. The The best thing about that is that I can automate that compression later. So like if there's a, a soft bridge where it's a whispery vocal, I'll just cut that or mute that compression out. Now I have a dry vocal. So it's just a way of automating hardware, I guess, you know, after the fact. But I always like will clip gain the, the relationship between the the dry and the wet, you know, if I need a little bit more excitement, I'll, I'll push the, the hardware print up. And, but it, I find it very important to have that dry track because the vocal still speaks, it still pops out of the mix, but it's so full, you know, it's not squashed, nothing squashed. Mm-hmm. So you're always running that dry track in combination, well, in parallel with, the, with your compressed signal. Yeah, yeah, always with vocals. I still do, um, you know, further processing uh, once, it hit, once it gets back in the box as well. And that depends on what the song needs. If it's like a, a rock song, we might add a little bit more like saturation, might load up Spectre and, you know, all, all different types of plugins, whatever we need, Futz box if we have to, like yeah. <laughs> any, everything. Yeah. So then as far as the automation side of it goes with vocals, um, like is automation kind of a thing that you like to do early on in your process or do you kind of just save it all for the end once you've brought in everything else? I do everything um, on the fly. As we go, like there'll be obvious automation things or moves that you know you need to make. So I'll just I'll just make them. If it's not correct, I'll just change it later. You know, Every, I'm always just moving forward, 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 and you know I'm not married to anything. Uh, so if if I've you know spend a bit of time creating something and then later in the in the thing if it ain't working, there's no love lost. I just get rid of it. Mm-hmm. Love that. Mm-hmm. And then, so from vocals, you get that acapella mix, and then you said you move on to drums. And then, as far as like um, the rest of the mix, like what do you you go to drums, and then is there like a specific order after that usually, or is it kind of just whatever you feel is important to the song? Yeah, yeah. Um, depending on what what style of song it is, and um, yeah, what what sort of feeling I want to go for, or, or what it needs, um, it'll always be drums uh, next. I'll bring up the music, like um, just dry as is and see how it fits. Because a lot of the time with guitars, they might not get processed at all. Um, if it's feeling good, it is good. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. as far as like um, making creative moves in the mix, um, you know, what does that process process look like for you? Like uh, as far as like adding effects to, to your tracks and stuff like, is that something that again is on the fly as, as it comes to you? You're like, I got to try this idea. Or is that something like you kind of get your mix done and then you mess around with effects after the fact? Yeah. The, um, more often than not, it's once the mix is in a, in a happy place and then you're like, Oh, cause you, I don't know, something in your brain just flicks, switch flicks. And then you, you're more into an artistic creative rather than a scientific mode. Um, <laughs> That's that's how that works. Yeah. But with my with my vocal effects, um, a lot of the time I won't use plugins. I'll use hardware. And um, my Desert Island piece of gear is a Eventide H three thousand. I've got I've got two of them. I wish I had twelve of them <laughs> because I like to. Um, there's a there's a whole bunch of presets that I work through. Um, I just can't get it in the plugin world. Um, and it's usually between like 519 micro pitch shift to 579 breathing canyon. There's a, there's like 12 passes I'll print between those in between that range. And then, you know, I'll um, either automate it or delete it or boost it later. It takes a long time, but I don't know. It's just, I can't recreate that in a plugin world. And I've been trying for 10 years. I still can't do it. <laughs> I guess sometimes, yeah, you have that piece of equipment that, like, I, I do think that a lot of equipment, or you, you can get away with the same results a lot of times using various plugins and whatnot, but it's going to take you a lot longer to get there, right? Whereas, like, sometimes you just got that one piece of equipment that just gets you the gets you across the finish line much, much faster, and it's like, why why would you mm-hmm. waste all your time doing all that other stuff, you know, chasing a yeah. sound when you can just go to the go to the source and get it done once, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's right. I find. Um, because I do like mixing with analog summing, and I, I find I can get a mix up a lot faster than I can when I'm working in the box. 
But at the end, it's so much longer making stems, you know, because all of the stems that you need, like maybe it's got to go for Atmos or, you know, your live backing tracks. It takes forever to print stems properly. And I'm always meticulous with the way I print stems. I want to hit play and the the mix is the mix at Unity So uh, for the client. Um, but when you're working in the box, it's, you know, the, the front end is, takes longer and the back end is much quicker. So, you know, pick your poison there. Yeah, I guess so, right? Yeah, I'm always yeah. I'm always intrigued by that. Like, you know, I, I I know so many people that still stick to that analog world and then it's like you really have to dial in your process there to to be efficient with it, right? Or like mm. or plan for it, you know. <laughs> so yeah. How long would you say it normally takes you to finish a mix? Yeah. Um on average, it can be depending on the arrangement. It could be anywhere from like six hours to a day and a half. You'll sometimes get a Black Swan mix that may take a few days just on that one song for for whatever reason it may be. Um, but yeah, usually I would say half a day to a day and a half. Yeah. And then um, you, how, how do you ultimately know when you're done with your mix? Yeah, when I, when I feel like... Um, I have nothing more to give and the song is speaking to me. Like, you know, I've got a relationship with the song. Um, it feels good. And then I'm like, yep, I'll send it to the client. And then, and then from there you just kind of go based on revisions and go back and forth. I'm guessing until it's done, right? Absolutely. From, um, I think the, the, the hardest thing to learn as a mixer is you've got to remember that the song is not yours and the song is somebody else's. And you just need to uh, not force something that's not meant to be, you know, onto it. It's 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 their song. So sometimes I might do a mix and I think it's the best thing in the world and I'll send it and they're like, no, we, that's not what we wanted. It's like, oh, but it's so good. <laughs> but yeah, we wanted an orange, not an apple, you know. Yeah. Something like that. So the, I think that's the that's the hardest thing to, to, um, to get your head around or, or like to get used to as a mixer. You know, it can be so crushing sometimes, but um, after time you get, you know, you, you just don't um, hold on to hold on to things. Yeah, like no, that. but I think that's a really important thing to bring up, too, because yeah, especially like for people who are who are new to this, like when they start getting revisions back and it, it almost seems insulting. You know, it's like, oh, I spent all this work on it. Like, I think it sounds incredible. And then the artist has this completely different vision for it. And you're like, oh, like now I got to make it sound worse, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But better or worse, it's all subjective. Fair. Um, you know, what somebody likes, another person doesn't like, and it's always going to be like that. So the way I look at it is you just do the best that you can and what you feel um, within the song and then present that to the client and then they're driving from that point. Just give them exactly what they need. It's the most important thing, you know, because we're, we're doing it for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, our job is to service them in the song. Of course, yeah. Our our job is exactly like you said. We're we're there to help them fulfill their vision of it, and you know the artists. They're the ones that have. They're the ones that created this stuff. They have their vision. They have their like their like, their way of wanting to present the song to the world. And so we have to go with their their instinct. Um, I was actually at a conference this last weekend, and um, they had uh, Drake's producer Noah should be or, or forty. He goes by I guess, um, and he was talking about this very concept, and he said that. Even for him, he's like, I'll send Drake like a hundred beats. And he gets back to me like, I like two of them. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's like, I have a 2% success rate with that guy, but that 2% counts, you know, like that's, those Absolutely. are the big ones, right? So it's like, you sometimes just have to get that thick skin under you just to realize like, okay, like the artist is right. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to like just fulfill their, their vision for it. And that's going to help the song grow to whatever it becomes. And, and at the end of the day, that's all, all that, all that matters is that the artist is happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, dude, this, this has been a lot of fun. Like I, I love learning more about your process and, um, and, uh, you know, learning about how you, pro like how you, how you approach your vocals. I thought it was really cool to learn more about this hybrid system. Um, at the end of the day, I guess I'm curious to know, like, what does a great mix mean to you at the end of the day? A, a great mix doesn't get in the way of the song. Uh, that that's when I th I find a mix is great. Like you'll hear a song that that sounds you know the snare sounds so good, it's so upfront and loud, but you're missing the song. You know, it's it's not it's not cohesive. 
although you've got a great sounding kick and snare and you know components like that so to me a great mix doesn't interfere with the song it amplifies the song it, it pushes the song forward rather than you know have certain elements shine but having saying that everything is subjective and some songs need a massive snare like <laughs> Yeah, sometimes yeah. that's that is part of the energy, right? Like you have to have those big samples in there and whatnot to to make it sound more exciting, I guess, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I love it, man. Cool, dude. I don't want to take up any more, more of your time. I know it's super late for you on your time, so uh, I'm curious to know if if people want to learn more about you, follow you online. Um, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, I have a website, um, shaneedwardsmusic.com, and also you can follow me on Instagram which is Buddha Burger. Um, it's a long story, but yeah, <laughs> my name's Buddha Burger on Instagram. Right. On. <laughs> yeah, I'm always posting, uh, yeah, I'm posting up stories and uh, stuff from the studio. I love. Awesome. Well, I'll put those in the show notes too, so people can find it easier. Fantastic. Right on, man. Well, Shane, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's been great. I'm sure a lot of people uh, have learned a lot from this stuff and, and uh, yeah, definitely. You know, I've always done the serial compression thing when it comes to vocals, but I've always typically done that 1176 LA 2A thing that you were talking about earlier. But I, wanna, I think I'm going to try out that adding that uh, 3A in there. It sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. Or um, you can do it with the LA 2A. Just flip it. Just put the try the LA 2A first. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for taking time to do this. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So that was my interview with Shane Edwards, and I really enjoyed learning more about his process, and in particular, his vocal chain. I've always done the serial vocal chain thing myself, so it was really cool to hear someone else who's doing it, but who is also switching up some of the components and adding some extra ones in there, too. So yeah, I definitely thought that was a lot of fun to hear and um, to get his sense of why he likes to use those different components. And I think that's a really good lesson for any of you guys who are working on vocals. If you're trying to get that polished vocal sound, don't feel like you just need to use only one compressor. You know, oftentimes people are trying to keep things simple, and generally that's a good rule of thumb, but don't feel like that means that you absolutely can't use more than one compressor or more than one EQ in a chain. Sometimes each of those different components adds something different, and collectively the different components in that signal chain come together to get you something awesome. So I thought it was really cool that Shane went into detail about that and why he chooses the pieces that he does. I also thought it was really cool to learn about his process of jumping into audio full time because definitely it's a scary thing to do, especially when you've got a day job and, you know, you're making good money and all that kind of stuff. It can be very intimidating to just jump all in. But I liked hearing his story about, you know, how he approached it and some of the stuff that he was doing early on to get bands to come his way. And I think that his approach of working with bands in a live setting, that's a great way for people to get their foot in the door. And it really doesn't require any extra effort from the band because, you know, you just show up at a gig and record their live set. You know, it's not like they have to take time off of work to go to a studio, that kind of thing. So it is really an easy way to, yeah, get in touch with the band, get get them familiar with what you can do and to introduce them to, you know, what it might be like to work with you. And once you rock their socks off with a mix of their live stuff, it would only make sense that the natural progression would be to get them to actually come into the studio and work with you on a deeper level. So yeah, I love that Shane touched on that. And uh, I think it's definitely another great lesson for anyone who's thinking about getting into this full time. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you got a lot of great stuff out of this one. And if you did, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you're not already. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And if you're looking for help with your mixes, let's say you're not sure of what to do with your vocals to get them to sound really clear and, and polished, or your drums are lacking energy and you're not quite sure how to get them to sound punchy and you know cut through a mix and feel as heavy as your favorite records. If you're looking for help with that kind of stuff and you're ultimately trying to finish working on a project with your music, whether it's a single or an album, I would absolutely love to help you cross that finish line. And inside of my coaching program, Amplitude, I work one-on-one -on -one with all my students to help them get the answers they need in order to make their music sound just as good as they've always envisioned it and to feel proud and excited to share their music with the world. So if you're interested in learning more about getting one-on-one -on -one help and getting access to all of our programs and mastering and a whole bunch of other stuff, like I said, this program is very comprehensive. We're, we're here to help you get this stuff done and make it sound awesome. So if you're interested in learning more about that, make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude, and you can find all the information on that page there. That said, we've reached the end of this episode. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end, and I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. 
To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com. <laughs>